At about 2 a.m. that night, while soundly asleep, I again rolled out of my bed, but this time I remembered afterward what I'd been dreaming before I hit the floor. It was a nightmare, all right, and it was about my stamp collection. Something had happened to it. The design on two sets of my stamps had changed in a dreadful way without my knowing when or how. In the dream, I'd gotten the album out of my dresser drawer to take with me to my friend Earl's, and I was walking with it toward his house, as I'd done dozens of times before. Earl Axman was ten, and in the fifth grade, he lived with his mother in the new four-story yellow brick apartment house built three years earlier on the large empty lot near the corner of Chancellor and Summit, diagonally across from the grade school. Before that, he'd lived in New York. His father was a p musician with the, with the Glenn Gray Casaloma Orchestra, Cy Axman, who played tenor saxophone beside Glenn Gray's alto. Mr. Axman was divorced from Earl's mother, a theatrically good-looking blonde who'd briefly been a singer with the band before Earl was born, and according to my parents, was originally from Newark and a brunette, a Jewish girl named Louise Swig, who'd gone to Southside and become famously local, famous locally in musical reviews at the YMHA. Among all the boys I knew, Earl was the only child with divorced parents, and the only one whose mother wore heavy makeup and off-the-shoulder blouses and billowing ruffled skirts with a big petticoat underneath. She'd also made a record of the song Gotta Be This or That when she was with the Glen Gray, when she was with Glenn Gray, and Earl played it for me often. I never came upon another mother like her. Earl didn't call her Ma or Mom. He called her, scandalously, Louise. She had a closet in her bedroom full of those petticoats, and when Earl and I were alone together in his house, he'd show them to me. He even let me touch one once, whispering while I waited to decide what it, whether to do it. Whatever you want. Then he opened a drawer and showed me her brassiers, and offered to let me touch one of those. But that I declined. I was still young enough to admire a brassiere from afar. His parents each gave him a full dollar a week to spend on stamps. And when the Casa Loma Orchestra wasn't playing in New York, and was out touring, Mr. Axman sent Earl envelopes with airmail stamps postmarked from cities everywhere. There was even one from Honolulu, Oahu, where Earl, who wasn't above cloaking his absent father in splendor, as though to the son of an insurance salesman having a saxophonist with a famous swing band for a father, and a peroxide blonde singer for a mother weren't amazing enough, claimed that Mr. Axman had taken a private home to see the cancelled two-cent... had been taken to a private home to see the cancelled two-cent Hawaiian missionary stamp of 1851, issued 47 full years before Hawaii was annexed to the United States as a territory, an unimaginable treasure valued at $100,000, whose, whose central design was just the number two. Earl owned the best stamp collection around. He taught me everything practical and everything esoteric that I learned as a small kid about stamps, about their history, about collecting mint versus used, about technical matters like paper, printing, color gum, overprints, grills, and special printing, about the great forgeries and design errors, and prodigious pedant that he or prodigious pedant that he was, had begun my education by telling me about the French collector the French collector, Monsieur Herpin, who coined the word philately, explaining its der its, der its derivation from two Greek words, the second of which, Adelaea, meaning freedom from tax, never quite made sense to me. And whenever we'd finished up in his kitchen with our stamps, and he was momentarily done with his domineering, he'd giggle and say, Now let's do something awful, which was how I got to see his mother's underwear. In the dream, I was walking to Earl's with my stamp album clutched to my chest. When someone shouted my name and began chasing me, I ducked into an alleyway and scurried back into one of the garages to hide and to check the album for stamps that might have come loose from their hinges when, fleeing my pursuit, when fleeing my pursuer, I'd stumbled and dropped the album on the very spot on the sidewalk where we regularly played I Declare War. When I opened to my 1932 Washington Bicentennials, twelve stamps ranging in denomination from the half-cent dark brown to the two-cent yellow, I was stunned. Washington wasn't on the stamps anymore. 
unchanged the top of each stamp, lettered in what I'd learned to recognize as white-faced Roman, and spaced out on either one or two lines was the legend, United States Postage. The colors of the stamps were unchanged as well. The two-cent red, the five-cent blue, the eight-cent olive green, and so on, all the stamps were the same regulation size, and the frames for the portraits remained individually designed as they were in the original set. But instead of a different portrait of Washington on each of the twelve stamps, the portraits were now the same and no longer of Washington, but of Hitler. And on the ribbon beneath each portrait was no longer the name Washington either. Whether the ribbon was curved downward as on one half-cent stamp and as on the one half cent stamp, and the six, they're curved upward, as on the four, the five, the seven, and the ten, or straight with raised ends, as on the one, the one and a half, the two, the three, the eight, and the nine, the name lettered across the ribbon was Hitler. It was when I looked next to the album's facing page to see what, if anything, had happened to my 1934 National Park set of ten that I fell out of bed and woke up on the floor, this time screaming. Yosemite in California, Grand Canyon in Arizona, Mesa Verde in Colorado, Crater Lake in Oregon, Acadia in Maine, Mount Rainier in Washington, Yellowstone in Wyoming, Zion in Utah, Glacier in Montana, the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, and across the face of each of the cliffs, the woods, the rivers, the peaks, the geysers, the gorges, the granite coastline, across the deep blue water, and the high waterfalls across everything in America that was the bluest and the greenest and the whitest, and to be preserved forever in those pristine reservations was printed a black swastika. And that is the end of chapter one.